Okay, let me now introduce to you Evelyn Berg, um, the chair of the audit committee of the Bank of Ireland. Evelyn, I mean, there are a lot of things you have done <laughs> as your profession, I can see. Um, so it's quite a long list if I read that out, what you have done in the past. So I think, um, you know, I'd like to mention your last position um, that you were the CEO of Bupa from 2012 until 2016. And um, you stepped down about one year ago uh, to develop a portfolio career. You are a member of various uh, board, board meetings today. Um, and I'd like to mention that you are a member of the Marks and Spencers board, um, of the Audit and Denomination Committee of Marks and Spencers, of the board of the Admiral Group, member of AJ Bell, and um, a non executive director of London First. We are very happy to have you here and get to know what you think about the new challenges of the banks in the post-crisis post -crisis and how internal auditors can help to face them. So I'd like to hand over to you, Evelyn. Thank you, Andrea, and thank you very much for um, uh, having me this morning. It's a real pleasure to be here. The, um, so I'll start and just talk a little bit about the challenges and the opportunities um, that banks face in this uh, not quite post-COVID world. Um, yes, we're a part way, I think we're a long way through it, but the pandemic is very much still with us. And then I'll talk a bit about um, the challenge, what that means for internal audit. I'm very happy then to take some questions. So the challenges, uh, and I know many of you will know these, but it's it's just worth um, standing back and reflecting on them. The economic environment, the outlook is still very uncertain and volatile. We've yet to see how various parts of the economy will respond as government supports are removed. We have been in a place recently where the outlook for interest rates was actually lower for longer, um, but that is changing. Inflation is rising strongly. We don't yet know whether it's really a short term issue due to supply chain congestion and post pandemic um, indigestion, or will it last longer? Um, will it translate into expectations and therefore have a bearing on interest rates over time? But also in this pandemic, um, those of us uh, involved in uh, audit committees um, have uh, had a huge focus on credit in credit generally and how it's been affected. Um, by the changes in the world around us and the consequences for impairment provisions. Um, and I imagine, like many audit committees, we spent many, many hours on uh, the IFRS 9 provisions for um, not only at the half year 2020, but year end 2020 and um, at, the, at the half year in 2021. Um, and these will continue to be a huge uh, focus um, as we face into the end of 2021, notwithstanding you know, the actual outturn so far has probably been more benign um, than many of us expected. So having seen uh, a very significant buildup of impairment provisions through 2020 and on balance sheets at the end of 2020, um, over the course of 21, we've seen some stabilisation and um, some releases. But yes, we know we don't yet know how the full unwind of government supports will play out and will affect some particularly sensitive sectors of economy, such as tourism and travel and hospitality generally. Um, another challenge which uh, has been very particular for um, Ireland, obviously, has been Brexit. So um, we are in a post-Brexit world of sorts, I think it's fair to say. Um, there is, however, the, the new ultimate post-Brexit arrangements are not yet fully resolved and not in place. And of course, we're all aware of quite intense negotiations going on between the European bodies and uh, Britain in respect of Northern Ireland. And of course, this continues to present risk for sectors of the economy that have been hugely dependent on trade with Britain. So um, I think we're going to be living with the consequences of um, Brexit for some considerable time. Um, uh, against that, we're also seeing some developments in, in the markets in Ireland. We have seen some exits from the Irish banking market, which has enabled, enabled the remaining banks like ourselves in Bank of Ireland to actually um, increase um, our loan book. And, you know, one wonders, is there 
more to come, I think. And even taking a bet on it would say there definitely is. But how and when it plays out and when indeed will that consolidation have more of an international flavour? Um, we don't know, but um, it feels like it's a bit more likely than maybe it used to be. And then in a kind of in the realm of the more of the day to day, we are operating in an increasingly digital world. And this was given a huge impetus by COVID. And Andrea, of course, has referred to that. However, with the greater use of digital for our day to day lives and transactions, there's obviously an increasingly greater cybersecurity risk exposure. Um, we know too well that the bad actors out there are very well resourced and highly motivated and the threats that we all face um, are greater. They're more dynamic and they have more skills behind them. So organisation resilience in the context of this increased threat um, in, in a world where customers depend on us day to day and they also expect increasing accessibility of all of their traditional banking services is huge. Um, and just to give you a, a sense of that for us in Bank of Ireland, 45% of the payments of the Irish economy flow through Bank of Ireland. So if there is an operational resilience issue around systems availability, the actual fallout immediately in the day-to-day -day lives and um, people in our economy um, are very, very significant. And indeed, people, as you won't be surprised, get on social media very, very quickly nowadays to tell us how they feel about what they're experiencing. We face the, the general challenge of evolving customer needs and ensuring that we are meeting and servicing them effectively to get the right outcomes for our customers and help them with their daily lives. Um, and we have to recognise that some of the assumptions we had about that might not be the same in the post-pandemic world, and we're still learning how that is playing out. But there's no doubt that expectations of everybody, ourselves included, have been shaped by organisations like Amazon, which have incredible responsiveness and changed expectations dramatically about the speed with which we can order goods and expect it to be delivered. And of course, we've also seen the challenger banks like Revolut and the services they provide. And uh, they are presenting, you know, huge challenges to us traditional banks with legacy systems. We have to be more agile to protect our franchises but we also face significant investment in technology and digital capability, and that is hard work um, on top of legacy systems. And again, COVID has cre increased the spotlight on the behaviour and social responsibilities of banks. We had to move fast initially in this, to introduce payment breaks to help customers and companies. And this was a tricky balancing act, protecting the interests of customers, but also protecting shareholders. And in Ireland, this was additionally complicated by the fact that there are still significant government ownership stakes in the major banks. So it's not always clear to the consumers whether they're actually dealing with shareholder, fully shareholder organisations or indeed public enterprises. And that leads into the whole question of ESG, which is incredibly topical um, and increasingly table stakes for banks. Governments are under huge pressure to actually buy their societies to actually respond to the pressing challenges of climate change and in the reality of the day-to-day -day impact um, being much more in our faces than it used to be. And banks have a huge role to play as traditional funders of all types of industries, but particularly those with, that are under pressure to go green. And that is a difficult balancing act as the green energy alternatives are not yet sufficient to enable the world to step away from the usage of fossil fuel. So, you know, we have to work with governments and with major companies to actually step through this in an orderly fashion. But the pressure is intense and you only need to follow the COP26 this week um, to really see that. We're also seeing um, continually rooms of regulators um, and obviously governments uh, along with that. Um, we have seen very significant regulatory change over the last number of years. PSD2 has been a major undertaking. Um, you know, there's still, it's not 100% implemented yet. There's also the drive for open banking. And indeed, Andrea mentioned um, the ongoing escalation of AML requirements as a, we are continuing to have to battle financial fraud um, in, all its, uh, uh, in all its manifestations. And the reporting and governance requirements um, on organisations um, like leading banks in the markets are 
just continuing to rise as a consequence of that. Our regulators need to see more of what we do. They need more transparency and more comfort that the urgent requirements that they have are being addressed. And all this, of course, affects the world of work and our people. Um, COVID has indeed, as Andrea again referenced, you know, led to this dramatic shift to home-based um, working. And it's caused many people to rethink what they want for their lives and how they want to work. Um, so it's been interesting to see as, you know, there has been the ability for more people to come back to work, quite a significant reluctance on the part of many employees to come back into the workplace in the ways they did in the past. And whether that's about commuting demands or better being, being better able to manage family requirements while working at home. But we as employers have to recognise that things have changed and we've got to find a way to make workplaces attractive and functional and a means of actually enabling that culture glue, that innovation, and indeed that support for people who are starting newly into the workplace or indeed starting new roles, while at the same time being receptive and understanding and supportive of the daily life needs of our employees. And this is indeed exacerbated by the huge demand we're seeing for specialist skills such as data and digital skills. It's very hard for traditional banks to compete with well-funded startup businesses who can offer a very exciting workplace and indeed hold out the promise of flexibility, autonomy and potentially quite attractive financial rewards. Um, but, you know, we have we desperately need those skills. So we have to find ways to compete um, in that in that world for those skills. And in Ireland, in addition, um, we have also seen intense competition for technical skills in finance, risk and internal audit as international banks have set up more operations in Dublin uh, in response to Brexit. So overall, you know, we live in a time of very significant technological and social change where it's hard to predict how things will play out. Um, this vast explosion of data and computing power has enabled new approaches to credit decisioning, to risk management and, you know, to the day to day way we live our lives. So you know, the challenge for us all as organisations is to remain fit for purpose to make sure we don't have blind spots and to stay on the watch for those risks that can hit us from, you know, things we have never anticipated before. But the good news, it's not all about challenges right now. We are, we do have opportunities. Um, the actual recovery from the first, the early phases of the pandemic has been stronger and more positive than initially expected. In our home market in Ireland, we're seeing GDP growth of 15% being expected. Um, so we're seeing we have you know, to work out how to make sure we respond appropriately to that, to capture the opportunities and look after our customers. How does internal audit help all of this? Well, first of all, it absolutely goes without saying that it's critical that the third line of defence is working really well. It must continue to be appropriately challenging and forensic. Um, we, as boards of banks and audit committees of banks, and the regulators as our partners um, are hugely dependent on having robust uh, internal audit functions. Internal audits need to adapt to the changing world that we live in. It needs to be very clear on the short and longer term objectives of the organisation and the challenges we face and ensure that they are being responsive to the needs of the businesses and the stakeholders. It needs to be respected by colleagues and having the right work right people with modern working methods and a dynamic agenda. Things change fast. The old world of audits taking three to six months to come out with findings probably doesn't serve us very well anymore. We do need more insight faster from the work of internal audit. And I know internal audit teams are taking that on board. Um, and it's important that we very much rely on the risk management frameworks we have installed in our organisations to help us um, anticipate and manage the risks that we face. And our internal audit colleagues are very important in helping us um, be confident that those risk management frameworks are well installed and functioning well. And I think in this world of you know, dynamic change, it's important that internal audit remains outcome focused and actually that its advice is helping the business, you know, not get lost in the process 
but actually keep their eye on what ultimately we're all trying to achieve, because we may have to adapt the ways we're operating to actually ensure that that outcome is delivered rather than just um, robotically deliver on a particular process. So we're, we're finding that that emphasis on outcome is an increasing part of our conversations. So I'd just like to finish this off by saying, you know, first of all, um, I as a board member um, um, really appreciate the work of my internal audit uh, colleagues in Bank of Ireland headed by Steve. Um, and, uh, you know, for us, it's very, very important that we have strong internal audit, audit capabilities. They, they actually help me sleep at night. So with that, I'm very happy to um, hand over and uh, see what questions and comments there might be. Thank you, Evelyn, very much about this um, good overview of what are the challenges of the banks um, and also for the internal audit functions. So now um, I think Evelyn is very happy to take your questions via Slido. OK, here we have the first question. What is your advice in terms of hiring internal auditors? Uh, I think we need a good basic training in uh, investigation, analytics, um, and communication. I think those fundamental skills remain very important. And they can come sometimes, from, you know, they largely come from a financial background, but also increasingly risk and um, IT technology backgrounds are particularly important. Um, so we're looking for, you know, all organisations are looking for very bright, very motivated and very engaged um, people, very and curious people who are prepared to ask to, to think around the corners and not to just take um, a process that's been given to them, but also ask, well, what else is going on around here? And come with that curious and engaged um, mindset and also have good skills of engaging with colleagues. It is important that when internal audit goes into the business to do its work, actually it's having a constructive dialogue with its colleagues um, and people around you know, having, will actually be open and share what they see. It's very important that people embrace internal audit, not just see them as some form of um, in scare or intimidating um, factor. So, you know, those interpersonal skills are also very important um, alongside strong technical skills. Thank you. We have another question. Any suggestion in terms of collaboration between internal audit and the regulator? Um, I just think we have to um, be, be facilitating of a very open dialogue um, between the internal audit function of an organisation and the regulator. Um, you know, when I speak with our colleagues um, in the CBI and the JCA, they do emphasise how much they rely on the internal audit function of the bank um, working well being well resourced, having the right skills and being uh, completely transparent. So, you know, as far as I'm concerned, there you know, shouldn't be anything that um, internal audit isn't able to discuss um, with the JCA. One would expect that um, anything they might, internal audit is discussing with the JCA might, would be known to, you know, the executives of the organization and um, the, uh, the, the governance bodies of the organization that's just a given um but i would just emphasize we expect a very collaborative and constructive and transparent relationship yeah um, i would also agree come to the next question do you think that banks are spending sufficient amount of money and effort to be able to keep up with the challenges caused by fintechs i i just think it's incredibly challenging and um, the fintechs are changing the game in terms of computer, in terms of consumer um, expectations, and we have to um, to respond to that. Um, they don't always get it right, and we know there are well trodden examples of fintechs where, while they actually have a lot of very attractive functionality to offer consumers, um, they have weaknesses in some of their AML practices, um, and uh, you know. So, 
they don't always have deep pockets. And I think consumers want the reassurance that the organisation that they're really playing, placing the bulk of their financial affairs with will be there for them through thick and thin. But um, while traditional banks typically have you know, deep pockets and are well capitalized. We can't just rely on that as a means of continuing to attract and retain customers. We must, um, you know, really pay serious attention to what the fintechs are doing for customers and how do we overcome the challenges that they face. So, uh, you know, do are we spending enough money? Probably not, um, as we have to balance the requirements of shareholders for dividends and customers and the regulatory agenda. But I have no doubt we will continue to spend a lot more money driven by that need to remain digitally relevant and accessible um, and uh, attractive to our customers. Yeah, and uh, probably it's not all about money, right? I mean, I think the yes. incentive for new talents also change. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay, yeah. We have more questions, Evelyn. So <laughs> let us move on. Where do you think internal audit functions should do more? Um, to help banks to be sufficiently resilient dealing with the increasing threats you described? Well, I think this comes down to um, the audit planning. And uh, we have, you know, obviously the normal approach is internal audit do um, a plan at the start of every year and it's based on the assessment of the risk profile. And we've got to make sure that they, um, you know, we really are prioritizing the right risks when we put that plan together. But actually, we've also got to recognize that that plan can can change and adapt in response to um, uh, to emerging risks that maybe we hadn't seen, we hadn't thought were significant enough when we put the original plan together. So I think it's as much about um, that agility and responsiveness to how the environment is shifting and the threats that are arising um, and as as it is to, you know, actually getting it, shall we say, right at the outset. It's that I think the mindset's got to be one of we will set off on a journey with a plan, but, you know, we have to be recognised that the plans have to be adapted in the face of the emerging realities that we face. OK, thank you. How has the operating model for internal audit at, at Bank of Ireland changed in the past year? Oh. See from the perspective of the audit committee, different rhythm, yes. sample reporting style, debates in the audit committee. That's the next question. Yes, great question. And it's uh, certainly been a topic of some debate. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so obviously we've all, you know, the, the um, internal audit function along with the rest of the organization had to pivot to working from home from March um, 2020. So it meant that internal audit had to rethink their methods how do they, rather than actually being able to physically, you know, sit beside colleagues in a department and collect data and have, you know, discussions in real time, um, they actually obviously had to to work um, a lot via Zoom. So I think a couple of things have happened. One is, um, you know, that we're deploying more digital and data tools to enable us to actually kind of do the analytics, which might help us highlight, um, uh, which will help us highlight the um, you know, what, what might be underlying issues. Um, the great thing is that the digital and capabilities have enabled us to have more coverage, whereas before there was a, it was a kind of sampling basis often to um, identify uh, issues. Um, now you can actually probably with the, the analytical tools available, you can actually get 100% coverage of many areas. Um, but also um, the, the team have had to pivot to um, more short, sharp audits. Um, partly reflecting the fact that the organization in response to COVID had to do a number of different things. So, you know, rather than say, oh, my goodness, OK, well, you know, we have to continue on the plan that we had agreed at the beginning of the year. We're now saying, actually, we have to reprioritize that plan. And for example, one of the you know big things we as an organization had to do in response to COVID for our customers was introduce significant payment breaks. Well, we needed the internal audit function to sit across that as it was being implemented and understand, you know, that advise us on whether the all the aspects that needed to be thought about from a risk perspective were covered off and that this was being done also looking at the best outcomes for customers. So it's, um, it's definitely required very significant adaptation in ways of working. 
Um, and uh, and the, st- the team have stepped up well. Uh, the other thing I'd say also is, um, with the other facet we've all got to be aware of in responding in this home working environment is the level of burnout has probably been higher. People are dealing with difficult home working environments, sometimes homeschooling of children at the same time as trying to do their jobs. And there's been this sense of always on, which has kind of added to the burnout pressure. So, you know, the added thing which Steve's team have been at the um, board in the brunt of some of this, and we as an organisation have had to respond with more well-being support um, for our teams. And I think that's going to be something that will remain. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a very important point and probably um, often underestimated. Yeah. Yes. Um, we have another question. This touches now a topic which is, you mentioned it's very important, it's upcoming risk sustainability, uh, upcoming topic as I say, recommendations in terms of collaboration between internal audit and the sustainability officer. Well, it's a new territory which is now very much part of, you know, the the agenda of the organisation, the agenda of boards, and therefore um, something that has to be part of the plan for internal audit in the year. Um, we're all learning. I think this is a, it's a very rapidly shifting space. Um, so I think uh, we would, you know, as a chair of intern of the audit committee, I would be wanting Steve to make sure that his team are engaged with the sustainability team, understand their agenda, and also reaching in and saying, is there some more education we need? What's going on? And I would ask, I would expect them to be talking to their peers in other organisations and also some of the um, the advisory bodies that have emerged on what good practice looks like and where to have their eyes as we all try to grapple with how we respond to the urgency of the sustainability agenda. Yeah. Do you have any views on what would be a good point in time to look at this topic and how to look at this topic? Um, what would be your expectation when it comes to audit? to um, look from a governance perspective or more on on the product basis what would be helpful for you in the audit committee well i mean as, as the i think i would expect that the internal audit team would have some review of the plans in place um, of the sustainability team and the initiatives in place um, there's also extensive new reporting required as of this year, and I would certainly expect internal audit to be doing a certain amount of vetting that the underlying data um, that's actually going into these reports is accurate. So yes, so it's it's actually Andrea right here and right now. Yeah, I think so. And you know, and the and you mentioned that, and I also think it's a very important point: the um, the speed of yes, changes, yes. Um, and that is something completely new to us and. I think to audit us, it's uh, also quite, you know, difficult since we are more, you know, risk oriented, I would say, and risk averse. Yes. Even. Um, and now coming up with sharp, you said short and sharp um, yes, uh, yes. messages. Um, that is something we also think we need to learn. And um, I guess it's uh, of utmost importance for you as an audit, as an audit committee. It is indeed. Yes. Okay. Well, um, thank you very much for um, your talk and also thank you for uh, you know answering your questions. You can see there's a lot uh, of there yes. were a lot of questions uh, and um, yeah, it um, shows that um, the auditors also need to get the perspective or want to have the perspective of the audit committee um, and the importance of a good dialogue between the audit committee and um, the audit community, of course. Well, um, then, thank, thank you, you Andrea. again. Um, thank a you lot everybody. of thought for us.